Hi, um, we're just going to do a short video here to talk about some of uh, some well-known frauds or some of my favorite frauds. Uh, the problem I had with this class is I probably had a good six to eight weeks of material and trying to get it focused down for a four-week session. So, of course, we're going to start by learning a little bit about fraud, but then we're going to move into doing some um, analytics uh, since that's one of the other things I teach. It was a great way to combine the two. So let's start off by talking about some common for or some well-known frauds. So the first one is some just some general stats. Uh, worldwide frauds are approximately $3.7 trillion a year. That is equal to 5% of the world gross domestic product. In the U.S., uh, annual frauds are about $1 trillion, so still quite a sizable amount, and it's still pretty equal to the 5,000 GD or 5% GDP, depending on uh, the year, of course. So Wells Fargo, uh, this was in, discovered in 2016, but they had incentives and very high sales goals that continued to rise from a period of about 2002 to 2016. In order to meet these quotas, uh, you know, employees were incentivized to basically open up fake accounts under their customers' names. So a lot of this fraud started at some of the mid-level uh, managers, and it happened to be that they opened up more than 2 million fake accounts over that time period. As a result... Wells Fargo will pay over $3 billion in fines to the SEC. Of course, the bigger issue is trying to get trust back of their employees. As of 2009, uh, the District of Columbia, as in the city itself, had the largest municipal fraud. Uh, in approximately about 10 years, uh, 11 co-conspirators basically took about $48 million in bogus tax refunds. So this department was responsible for issuing, uh, for collecting the property taxes for anybody who owned property within the District of Columbia. And during the time, they also issued property tax refunds for various reasons. Uh, Harriet Walters, who was kind of the lead of this um, scheme, decided to uh, issue fraud refund or uh, fraudulent tax refunds to herself and to friends. And that is actually how this fraud didn't get caught. So by keeping all of her friends happy and lav giving them lavish gifts and trips to the casino, they stayed mum and not didn't raise a suspicious eye on the fact that uh, where she was getting all this money. Of course, there is this typical excuse, rich boyfriend, passed away, uh, inheritance, things like that. But none of them, of course, were true. This case is detailed in our textbook. I believe it's, ch it's uh, oh, chapter 13. So one of the other frauds, and this was the late 70s, early 90s, was Crazy Eddie. And this was an electronic store mostly in New York City. I had the opportunity to hear Sam Antar, the CFO of this organization, speak. Uh, we'll talk probably more about that later. But first, they had an elaborate skimming scheme to try to reduce their sales, or at least what they reported as sales, in order to reduce what they pay for taxes. This helped grow the business because they were able to offer lower prices to their customers and thus increase volume. Then, as an effort to go public, they overstated their sales. By quite a bit. Uh, they did this, um, you know, various ways to fraud the auditors. So basically to trick them into believing. And we'll talk about some of those schemes. When Mr. Antar spoke at our, um, at UNI about seven years ago, he talked about the one thing he never cheated on was his college degree, which was, by the way, in accounting. His family sent him to college in order to become the best accountant he could in order to help run the fraud schemes at Crazy Eddie to help them go uh, go to public. 
One of the cases we're going to be talking about soon is Rita Crundwell. Uh, she was in Dixon, Illinois. This is uh, a small city, uh, about an hour and a half to two hours east of the Quad Cities and about the same distance west of Chicago. One of the amazing things is this city had an annual budget, about $10 million. And think about how that compares to Washington, D.C., where it took 11 people 10 years to steal $48 million. Rita Cronwell single-handedly embezzled over $53 million over 20 years from the city government. Obviously, $53 million on a town that has an, uh, a budget of $10 million has a significant impact on their ability to provide the services that a town usually wants to provide. In the last 12 months before she was arrested, she stole $3.3 million. So we're going to watch the movie All the Queen's Horses, where it talks about where people thought she got her money, some of the schemes that she used, which were really not that complex, and who else might be at fault. Not directly that they stole money, but who else had a little piece of the blame in this? So what are the other big ones? And this was right, this combined with our next one, Enron, was one of the, some of the frauds that helped start uh, the legislation for Sarbanes-Oxley, which obviously tremendously changed how audits are done and how companies have to focus on internal control. So in WorldCom, uh, they went bankrupt in 2001. Um, I, yeah, they started recording before 2001. They really got caught in about 2001. So in 1997, they were merged with MCI and became a large telecommunications company. They were located in Jackson, Mississippi, and that actually played a bit a part into some of the story, which we'll get into in a minute. So it was trying to take over uh, other businesses. So... Bernie Ebers, who is the CEO, had been fi funding his side businesses with loans backed by WorldCom stock. So as the shares started, he became more desperate. So he started to record company expenditures or company expenses as expenditures of about $3.8 billion. This trick was discovered in 2002 uh, when the company entered bankruptcy. I had the opportunity to listen to actually see live Cynthia Cooper speak. She was the whistleblower who was the VP of internal audit. And she talks about her struggles deciding whether or not to whistleblow uh, when she knew it was there. She knew it was the right thing, but she knew by putting WorldCom out of business, which is what happened, all of her friends would be out of a job. WorldCom was the largest employer in Jackson, and there really wasn't another large company for about 100 miles around. So it was going to cause quite a bit of turmoil. She wrote a book that really talks about some of the struggles she had uh, with the decision, as well as how she was uh, working with her staff late at night. Uh, they rented another room to take records so they wouldn't get caught. So they were trying to get all the evidence and make sure they were correct before going ahead to uh, tell somebody. And of course, the biggest of them all, Enron. And I find this one interesting. Um, if you have the opportunity to watch the movie Smartest Guys in the Room, it is an excellent movie. And it really shows the toxic environment that was at Enron. They had a philosophy of do business, you know, make a profit no matter what. And they really lived up to that no matter what. Uh, Jeff Skilling was the CFO, and he actually worked with uh, the auditors and devised a plan of how they could basically record future sales as current revenue or projected future sales. Of course, if you're recording these and you're trying to get your stock price up, you're going to estimate very high. And that's what happened. And when they didn't have the sales to back that up as the market started falling in early 2001, a smaller recession, things started to collapse. 
So that's just a highlight of a few of the frauds that uh, there's either been some movies about or I've read the book or I've actually got to hear one of the fraudsters speak. So I hope you get hope this gets you a little excited about the topic and we'll get a look at a lot more fraud cases as we go through your textbook.